Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series on stewardship, motives of the heart. This is number eight in that series entitled, The Impact of Tithing. Hmm. This is the lesson for February 24 of 2018. And once again, as we always do, I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we recognize that everything we have belongs to you, that you have given it to us. We have no really honest claim to anything. Even life and, and, and health come from you. And so we should not have any problems in returning the small portion, the tithe, to uh, recognize our partnership with you. May that be our experience and trust. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So now if we faithfully give a tithe, what happens to it? Does it impact the giver? Does it impact those to whom it is given? What, what happens to that money? So this lesson will focus on the purpose and use of tithing. We'll talk about its impact, its importance, and how it is used within the church system. It is intended to be a blessing, first of all, to the giver, but also to the spreading of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Put yourselves to the test and judge yourselves to find out whether you are living in faith. Surely you know that Christ Jesus is in you, unless you have completely failed. So, are we, I mean, is it reasonable for us to put God to the test in our day? Do we, do we need to put our, our faith to the test? Well, you've got 2 Corinthians 13, 5 up there. Examine mm -hmm. yourself to see if you're in the faith, yeah. uh, unless you fail the test. Uh, so uh, are we walking in our own strength, or are we walking in, you know, because in the previous chapter, Paul had been ta talking about uh, the thorn in the flesh and that, uh, you know, when I am weak, then I am strong. So are we walking in his strength or are we walking in, in our own? As we know, the very first reference in the Bible to tithing is the story of Abraham and Melchizedek, Genesis 14. We've already studied how Jacob later agreed to pay a tithe after that experience uh, sleeping on that stone. Still later, they, the, the Levites were not given land to the tribal area in Canaan. They were to be supported by the, tri by the tithes from other tribes. Well, in New Testament times, Jesus commanded us to preach the gospel. Is that a serious responsibility? Look at Mark 16, verse 15. He said to them, Go throughout the whole world and preach the gospel to the whole human race. Do we, is that a responsibility for all of us, or is that just the pastor's responsibility, or just the general conference responsibility? All of us. All of us. Each of us needs to see what God would have us do individually. He says, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. So, what do you think? Is this, are those commands just, just for pastors and Bible workers? Carrie says no. No, we're not. those are supposed to be for all of us. And one way in which we can participate in the spreading of the gospel is by paying our tithes. Is that a reasonable assumption? Is that a reasonable connection? Yeah. Yeah. Now, when Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, was he talking about tithe? Well, he was talking about everything we have mm -hmm. and what we value. So, uh, again, our, is it the God, God's kingdom or our kingdom that's mm -hmm. most important to us? Are we seeking to build his kingdom or mine? Yeah. Well, in the last book of the Old Testament, that little tiny book called Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10, it says, 
bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you in, a, in abundance all kinds of good things. Does that still apply to us or is that just to the people living in Judah back in those days? I think it applies to us. So God could actually pour out a blessing more than we have room to receive? What was this house that God was talking about? The storehouse. Well, in the immediate context, it would have been the temple. Mm -hmm. They had storage there. So is there a there. temple equivalent today? Well, you could say the church. Churches. Yeah. Okay. So our church has a very regular, there's no question about this, whether we like it or not, it has a very regular, uh, clearly spelled out, way of, of, of giving to the church, of funding the church workers and pastors through the tithing system. In the scriptures, we have a clear picture of the person to whom Abraham paid his tithe. We also know how the tithes were handled in the days of the Levites and Israelites. But to whom do you think David, I'm sorry, to whom do you think Jacob paid his tithe? What did Jacob do for 20 years over there in whatever, whatever country you want to call that? Ur? Iran. Laban Iran. land. Laban land. What did he do with his, with his tithe? Or did he wait to pay it until he came back to? Canaan? Well, would the animals have been offered as sacrifices? Um, but we don't have any record necessarily, do we? I know when he came back to, to uh, his, you know, the land of what became Israel, he would have offered and built altars and sacrificed. But, uh, well, even a cursory evaluation of the giving habits of Christians demonstrates that very few of them give regularly to any church organization. Very few. If you look at all Christians, very few of them make any regular, any kind of a tithe, a regular payment. Uh, Gary, I think, are you the next re person there? That's me. No, oh, I'm sorry. Pat, Pat, Gary. In today's cultures, the majority of Christians give relatively little to fund the mission of God. If every Christian gave an honest tithe, the result would be, quote, almost unimaginable, simply astonishing, nearly beyond comprehension, unquote. And that came from two gentlemen, Christian Smith and Michael Emerson. Looks like they wrote a book, Passing the Plate. Mm-hmm. And it's quoted in the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, February 18th. Yeah. Is there any reason to think that God's plan for supporting His church, including those who are doing their best to spread the gospel, has changed since the days of Abraham? Is there any reason why we should believe that God, well, he, now He's decided He wants 20% maybe? Do you have any evidence for that? No. No. Nope. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is almost unique among Christian churches today. And this is, this is something we need to be aware of. We have a single organization that is attempting to spread the gospel to every part of the world. Now, if you look at most other Christian, especially the, mainly the Protestant churches, you'll find out that they have divided up the world, and the Methodists go here, and the Baptists go there, and, you know, depending on how big an area and so forth, and Presbyterians go work in some other area. But our little church is trying to spread the gospel to every part of the world. How do we do that? By offerings and donations and lots of prayer. Okay. I read somewhere recently we've caught up and actually passed our Catholic friends in hospitals worldwide. Yeah. Well, the Catholic Church, some would say, well, the Catholic Church has work all over the world, but it, they don't have a central organization. Mm -hmm. Here it's the White Brothers here, and some over it's the Benedictines, and somewhere else it's another group. They, and they, they're separate organizations. Well, this requires funds to support an enormous number of people. It also requires commitment from not only pastors, but also church members in spreading the gospel. Well, look at Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Very familiar passage, presumably, for Adventists. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God, praise His greatness, 
for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Is that an individual responsibility to each one of us? If so, what are we doing to spread the, the third, three angels' messages to everyone in the world? Well, we've already looked at Malachi 3.10. It clearly states that God will bless those who return a faithful tithe. What, what, what kind of blessings do you expect from God when, he, when you pay a tithe? Is it just financial? I think it's or are there other kind of blessings? Health. All kinds of things come into it. But you're really not giving it to get something back, per no. se, although he... It, the blessings come with the relationship to him, mm -hmm. and that's just part of our, rela our end of the relationship, and it's only one piece of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we enter, you know, in thy presence is, is fullness of joy, and in thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, if we enter a relationship with God, uh, we, we have all those things. He will provide for our needs. Uh, Paul knew how to be in abundance and, and in need. So sometimes God placed him where, where things weren't quite as bountiful as, as they were other times. So whatever God is, is you know, he will provide, our, provide for our needs. We have food and covering, let us therefore be content. Yeah. Now, some of you have probably heard stories like I've heard. People who for years thought they couldn't afford to pay tithe finally decided they would make the commitment to start paying tithe, and they found out that they were just as well off after several months of paying 10% tithe as they were previously when they had the 100% to themselves. Is that a proof of God's blessing? Well, if, if, we, if we're giving a 10% of our, of, of our income, or we're, or we're returning it to God, does that affect our faith in some way? Do we take the cause of God more seriously? Yeah, I think so. Part of the relationship. Part of the relationship. Part of, part, you know, if we're giving uh, to His cause to build up His kingdom, then... Uh, brings great joy to our hearts when we see that happen. Do, do we need God's blessings? Maybe we don't need them. Everybody needs his blessings. <laughs> if he doesn't bless, you, you'd cease to exist. Yeah. The adversary will wipe you out. But there's a sense in which he causes the sun to shine, the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So okay. he's, he's sustaining us all. He's right. providing for our, our, uh, our lives. Gary, I think you asked, uh, agreed to read 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9 there. To conclude, you must all have the same attitude and the same feelings. Love one another as brothers and sisters and be kind and humble with one another. Do not pay back evil with evil or cursing with cursing. Instead, pay back with a blessing because a blessing is what God promises to give you when, you when He called you. Okay. So who receives the greatest blessing when we pay our tithe? Is it us who do the giving? Or those who receive and use the monies brought into the Lord's storehouse? It's both. Bad question. <laughs> it's both. Yeah. And Jesus clearly promised well, how seriously, how we want to take this is up to us. Jesus himself promised that if we give what we've given back to us in a various ways. Luke 6, 38. Um, Dennis, I think you've got the next one there. Acts 20. Yes. Uh, Acts 20, verse 35. I have shown you in all things that by working hard in this way we must help the weak remembering the words that the Lord Jesus himself said, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. And where are those words found in the, word, in the, in the Gospels? Nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> the only so, place we have them is... How did, how did Paul know this? In the Gospel of Acts. 
in the Gospel of Acts. <laughs> well, he spent time with James and yeah. Peter, uh, you know, after his conversion, so they would have shared a number of things. And John concludes his Gospel with, there are many, many more things that could have been written yeah. down. Yeah. So what spiritual blessings can we expect from joining this partnership with God? You got some more words for us there? Is that... Yes, Jeremiah 17, 7, but I will bless those who put their trust in me. The special system of tithing was founded upon a principle which is as enduring as the law of God. This system of tithing was a blessing to the Jews, else God would not have given it to them. So also it will be a blessing to those who carry it out to the end of time. Our Heavenly Father did not originate the plan of systematic benevolence to enrich himself but to be a great blessing to man. He saw that this system of beneficence was just what man needed. Ellen G. White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 404 and 405. Okay, are we blessed by attending Sabbath school and church and fellowshipping with other believers? Sure better be. Well, Absolutely. Jesus yes. said he would be there if two or three are gathered in his name. It's so my favorite day of the week. Yeah. And we're, uh, we're blessed if we're open to that. Do you feel like other church members are kind of an extended family? Yes. Have you been blessed by the Lord through the ministry of others, such as the pastor and the Sabbath school teacher, maybe? So what, to, what can we do, each one of us, to bless others? Well, Paul in 1 Timothy 5, 18 says, for the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox when, we, when you're using it to thresh corn and workers should be given their pay. And he was thus quoting from Deuteronomy 25, 4 and words of Jesus in Luke 10, 7. The, 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 the biblical scholars believe that this, you shall not muzzle an ox while it heads out the grain, was probably an ancient proverb. So it was just quoted. So but Deuteronomy was quoting a proverb? <coughs> Moses was quoting an ancient proverb. Surely the ox who works all day long deserves to eat of the products of his work. Jesus is the one who said the labor is worthy of his wages. God could have arranged for the support of his work in some other way. Gordon at one point suggested maybe he could rain diamonds down from heaven. But he recognized... Or, or oil wells yeah, you know, under exactly. the church or something. Yeah. Uh, there was a time when the church could have bought... Uh, I know specifically of a time when the church could have bought a huge, whole, a huge area that was just later proved to be full of oil. We didn't do it. And I know of a time when the church actually owned someone in the church, someone in the Adventist church actually owned one of the largest diamond mines in the world but didn't know it was there and then turned against the church, lost it, and then came back to the church after they discovered all the diamonds on this property. Kind of sad story. Well, God could have arranged for the support of his work in some other way, but he recognized that a, that a systematic plan in which we are involved and end up being blessed is the best plan. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. In the same way the Lord has ordered that those who preach the gospel should get their living from it. And 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 11, 7 to 11, also from the Good News Bible, I did not charge you a thing when I preached the good news of God to you. I humbled myself in order to make you important. Was that wrong of me? While I was working among you, I was paid by other churches. I was robbing them, so to speak, in order to help you. And during the time I was with you, I did not bother you for help when I needed money. The brothers and sisters who came from Macedonia brought me everything I needed. As in the past, so in the future, I will never be a burden to you. By Christ's truth in me, I promise that this boast of mine will not be silenced anywhere in all Achaia. I do not say that because I don't... Do I say? Pardon me? Do I say Do I say that because I don't love you, God knows I love you? Okay. What, what should we learn from these passages? 
what way was Paul being paid by other churches and in effect robbing them to support the church at Corinth? He was actually receiving money being brought to him personally by people from Macedonia. And the churches in Macedonia, what was their financial condition compared to the church in Corinth? Would have been poor. Oh, yeah. They were much poorer. If you read through Philippians, you find that yeah. the Philippian, even when he went down to Thessalonica, which is also sort of in Macedonia, they were sent a gift to uh, support him there, and then they continued to send mm -hmm. gifts um, at the even up to the time of his writing of Philippians. Sometimes Paul himself would work all night long making tents so he could preach during the day. You can read about that, and, and let me just read 2 Thessalonians 3, 8. We were not lazy when we were with you. We did not accept anyone's support without paying for it. Instead, we worked and toiled. We kept working day and night so as not to be an expense to any of you. That's quite a statement, huh? Jim, I think you have something more on that. Let labor for souls become a part of your life. <clears throat> Go to the homes even of those who manifest no interest. While mercy, excuse me, while mercy's sweet voice invites the sinner, work with every energy of the heart and brain, as did Paul, who ceased not to warn everyone night and day with the tears, or with tears. The heavenly messengers are waiting to cooperate with your efforts. Will you do the work appointed to you of God? And that's found in Review and Herald, May 22, 1888. Right. 1888 is a famous time. So God has designed that the tithe be used for a particular purpose. God has designated that the tithe be used for a particular purpose. The tithe is set apart for a special use. It is not to be regarded as a poor fund. It is to be especially devoted to the support of those who are bearing God's message to the world, and it should not be diverted from this purpose. So, let's see if we can summarize a little bit of what we have learned. God apparently says, I want you to become partners with me by returning the tithe to me, and that tithe is to be used for the purpose of spreading the gospel. And I will bless it as it's being used in that correct way. Well, we've already looked at Leviticus 27.30, one-tenth of all the produce of the land, whether grain or food, belongs to the Lord. So, none of us here are farmers. At least not unless you're hiding something I don't know about. Um, so, how does that apply to us? Is this just for farmers? It's for everybody. It's for everybody. <clears throat> how do you well, know most that? Most of the people of the time were farmers or yeah, lived then. off the land in some way, mm -hmm. herding so it's just an example. Well, it's interesting that the Bible in, in, in several different places talks about storehouses. There was one for the wind in Jeremiah 10.30. There was one for water in the Psalm 37.7. Even one for snow and hail in Job 38.22. All of which are clearly controlled by God himself. There is a much, much more important storehouse which is very precious to God and that is the storehouse to which we pay our tithe. So is there a building somewhere where all the tithe goes? Well, on a local level, it Churches. goes to the church, the okay. local church. We have a larger system than just that. If you were a mm -hmm. congregational church, you, that's where it would pretty much stop unless you, and as, as a sorting house, and then you would, yeah. uh, you might sponsor other missionaries or something out of that, but Mm -hmm. It would be the local church as a starting point. Okay. Um, the Lord has said, I've given to the Levites every tithe that the people of Israel present to me. This is in payment for their service and taking care of the tent of my presence. Isn't that pretty simple? Um, based on this verse, our system of tithing is known as the storehouse principle. The Israelites were to bring their money and their goods for payment of tithe to the temple in Jerusalem. Deuteronomy 12, verses 5 and 6. More than 1,000 years later, they still clearly understood the meaning of this expression as used in Malachi 3, verse 10. 
several verses. Front Chronicles 26, verse 20, 2 Chronicles 31, 11 to 13, and Nehemiah 10, 38 say, God's storehouse is also called the temple treasury, the storerooms for gifts dedicated to God are just storerooms in the temple area. So where is the Lord's storehouse today? Well, we've already talked about that a little bit. Let's be very specific. If we give our tithe, we turn it into the local church, what happens to it? It goes to the conference. And okay, that money is not kept by the local church, it's passed on to the conference. And what happens at the conference level? We know they pay the pastors and uh, some of the Bible workers, and, and, a and portion they send it on. Yeah, a portion of it's sent on to the union, and a portion of it then sent to the division, and a portion of that is sent on to the general conference. And then out of that, money is used to spread the gospel in places where there aren't sufficient funds to, or maybe it's a new area to be entered. It's it's a pretty simple, straightforward plan. Members pay their tithe to the local church and is sent to the conference of mission. The conference of mission treasury arranges to pay pastors. A portion of the tithe is for war forwarded to the higher levels of the church. So, as God's work extends, who do we have for that one? Well, it was me, but right. I think you skipped over theirs. I'm there, sorry. there was a way, you know. <laughs> anyway, I'll I'll go ahead. <laughs> As God's work extends, um, calls for help will come more and more frequently. That these calls may be answered, Christians should heed the command, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Malachi 3.10 If professing Christians would faithfully bring to God their tithes and offerings, his treasury would be full. There would then be no occasion to resort to fairs, lotteries, or parties of pleasure to secure funds for the support of the gospel. L. G. White, Acts of the Apostles, 338. Are you saying we wouldn't have bingo? <laughs> bingo fundraisers at the church? Not our church, but some other churches? Well, I don't think, were, were they doing that? I know the other churches were. I think she was no, referring to the church as a whole. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the Christian churches. church as Christian, a whole. Yeah. How much, what, do you, what do you think would happen right today if sudden, if sudden we could flip a switch and all I events would start paying a faithful tithe? How would it impact the church? We'd enter areas in the world which we haven't been able to do, for starters. Okay, <coughs> we, would, we would be able to pay people to go and do that, is that what you're saying? Either that or like we're doing with Advent World Radio, we're covering vast territories that we never got into till we had that technology. Yeah. And I think some of that is funded probably from the GC, but it also goes on donations too, mm -hmm. to a large extent. And we'll be talking more about donations in future weeks. Well, in our day, there are those who feel that they should have the right to determine where their tithe money should be sent and how it should be used. Is that a, is that a good idea? Do people need to make careful, they need to study the situation, says, I want to send my tithe to there, that place, because I think they're doing what the Lord really wants us to do. It depends. Mm -hmm. there, there might be situations where you might look at what they're doing with the tithe, and you might want to say something. Um, I'm not exactly for giving it out and saying, well, it's gone, I paid it, I did my thing. Wherever it goes, that's where it goes. The Salvation Army has a, an interesting twist on this. If you give money, they make sure it goes back to your town. Mm -hmm. And that kind of covers what we you just brought up. Another yeah. variation of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Gary's saying that we should, you know, communicate. You know, if we do have concerns, we should uh, communicate those concerns. It doesn't necessarily mean that we should stop paying tithe, but... Yeah. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with, with giving an extra offering to support yeah. other causes, absolutely. Yeah. But not the tithe. We should not get the idea, however, that by paying tithe we are somehow earning our salvation. Salvation is a free gift, and we have lots of verses in the Bible to support that. Romans 3, 19 to 24, um, 
Romans 4, 1 to 5, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. There's no way you can earn our salvation. We are sinners and totally undeserving. We are saved by the unimaginable gift of God through Jesus Christ coming to this earth. As we submit our tithe, it is very natural for us to, from a human standpoint, to think even subconsciously that we are giving our money to the Lord. But as we've seen in our previous studies, that money was never ours. It has always belonged to God. Giving it back to Him is the right thing to do. However, we need to develop, develop that trusting relationship with God called faith. What do we know about faith? It comes by hearing. Okay. okay. Hearing by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Returning to Him what belongs to Him is a part of that relationship. Okay. Are we going to be humble partners of God or are we going to steal from Him? Jesus said that if we love God, we will obey Him. Um, the clearest place that is probably John 14, verse 15 here. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Is that straightforward enough? Returning the tithe to him is an outward expression of our trust in him. God asks us to dedicate to him one day out of seven for our time. of our time. He also asks us to return to him 10% of our income as a sign of our partnership with him. So... Is there, is there a difference in returning a faithful Sabbath keeping versus a faithful tithe thing? Or are they basically essentially, I mean, I understand that one is a material thing and the other is a, a time thing, but are they pretty much equivalent? Certainly interrelated. Okay. You want to read us something about that, Gordon? Luke 21, 1 through 4, from Good News Bible. Jesus looked around and saw rich people dropping their gifts in the temple treasury. And he also saw a very poor widow dropping in two little copper coins. He said, I tell you that this poor widow put in more than all the others. For the others offered their gifts from what they had to spare of their riches. But she... Poor as she is, gave all she had to live on. Now, what do you think? Is, is, that, a, is that an example of tithe paying? It doesn't appear to be. It's more like an offering, although it could have been. We don't know. Yeah. A little bit more like the widow that uh, fed Elijah. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a woman that gave everything. Apparently it's all she had. Why do you think she did that? Because she wanted to give, and that was all she had. Okay. Um, and it wasn't going to sustain her. And, it, you know, it's not like, well, if I hold on to this, maybe I'll buy a lottery ticket and, <laughs> and retire rich. You know, she, she, she wasn't thinking about how much she needed this. She was thinking about how, how much she wanted to give to God's yeah. treasury. Well, I have a brother-in-law who's done some traveling in various parts of the world, and one time when he was in Israel, he bought two little, he, he, he bought, and, and they have the little details there, where this coin was and what was made, and they're little tiny things, about like that. And he gave them to me. He says, I, you know, you, you do a lot more work with the Bible than I do, so he gave them. So I have them at home with a little, they're, they're sealed up in a little plastic thing and a little label on there about what they are. Little tiny things. I need to bring them sometime. We can all look. Maybe I should have brought them today. huh? Well, what do you think the Sadducees did? Because most of the temple offerings went to them. What do you think they did when uh, they saw these two little coins, copper coins? Probably threw them out. <laughs> they might have said, it's not worth bothering with this. Check it out. But... Uh, I don't know. But Jesus said she gave more than all the others, and that's because? Gave all she had. She gave all she had. I think she had more insight into the whole thing. You, further down there, you deal with it. The Sadducees, you know, they didn't just sneak up and put it in. No. They were very, very well dressed and probably made sure everybody saw it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And she was, Ellen White says she would stand there and wait till nobody was looking. She thought nobody was looking. 
Yeah. Put her offering in. Well, As one could say that the Sadducees were very cunning and they would accumulate all those little copper coins and <laughs> with thousands together, they'd have something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> A nice thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, what kind of an impact do you suppose her two little copper coins have had on the Christian church down through the generations? Quite a bit. Makes you think. Very inspirational. Yeah. How many of us give either offerings or tithe to the point where we actually suffer because of giving what we give? Well, what do we owe to God, Jim? I think you've got some verses on that. As someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. That's Acts 17, 28, but I think right above it's Acts 17, 25. You want to read that as well? Nor does he need anything that we can supply by working for him since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else in, to everyone. So if our life depends upon him and our, and our, our, our breath depends upon him, how much do we depend upon him? Everything. Totally. Mm -hmm. We're not self-existent. No. Well, w w this was a part of Paul's sermon to the people in Athens. So why is he talking about this stuff? Anybody? Well, when he talked to Jews, well, how did he preach? He preached from the Old Testament. He preached from the Old Testament. Yes. So now he's talking to a bunch of people who know nothing at all about the Old Testament. So what's he doing? He says, I want you to understand that this God that you don't know anything about is actually the one who sustains your lives. I mean, so he, 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 he talked to them about something that could appeal to them, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he said very clearly, your lives are dependent upon this God moment by moment. Ellen White goes on and says something Pretty incredible in that context. I think that's, is that yours, Gary, or did I? I'll, I'll take it, I don't mind. Parents, in wisdom and love, teach your children the grand lesson that in God we live and move and have our being. And that's, uh, I think, related to Acts 17, 28. Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. That's quite a statement. It really is. He watches over us by day, and under his wings we find shelter by night. His preserving care is over us, whether we wake or sleep. He is as a sentinel to guard us from Satan's power, or we should be taken captive by him. Jesus is our constant friend. We are to look to him moment by moment, and by looking to him we are to live. That's from Ellen G. White, Review and Herald, December 2, 1890, paragraph 15. Okay. Uh, so it is with God's claims. I think, uh, Gary, did I give you that one? <laughs> I'll take it. I don't know. Uh, Gary, or, go ahead, Gary. So it is with God's claims upon us. He places his treasures in the hands of men, but requires that one-tenth shall be faithfully laid aside for his work. He requires this portion to be placed in his treasury. It is to be rendered to him as his own. It is sacred and it is to be used for sacred purposes, for the support of those who carry the message of salvation to all parts of the world. He reserves this portion that means may ever be flowing into his treasure house and that the light of truth may be carried to those who are nigh and those who are afar off. By faithfully obeying this requirement, we acknowledge that all belongs to God. That comes from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 386, paragraph 2. Okay, so we need to ask ourselves, in light of what we've studied so far, does this system seem to be fair and equitable? Is there, does it... Does it discriminate against the rich? Does it discriminate against the poor? Does it 
Well, it would be a flat tax in yeah. mm -hmm. if you thought of it as a tax, although it's not. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's pretty hard to argue with, you know, other fellow church members that we're all paying the same rate, right? To say, you know, are you paying? Now, of course, that means that some people who earn more money will be paying a larger portion. But if we're all paying the same percentage, it's pretty hard to say, well, you know, you're not com supporting, you're, you're, not, you're not doing enough, or you're not doing as much as I'm doing. Seems to be a pretty fair system, right? That isn't the way our government collects taxes. <laughs> not the we way have a very progressive system with... Uh, a progressive tax, which is not a progressive system, I guess, in which a lot of people pay no tax and there's a progressively increasing rate the higher, you, the more you make. Yeah. Should the church do that? No. Who, would, who, would, who would dare to come up with a system that was, they thought was an improvement on what God did? Hopefully nobody. <laughs> Hopefully nobody. Yeah. Well, you can imagine, I'm sure, uh, and we've already seen, Ellen White spoke fairly frequently about the importance of tithing. How do you understand the following passage? <clears throat> and who has that one? Uh, I can take it. That's time is rapidly passing into eternity. That one there? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Let us not keep back from God that which is his own. Let us not refuse him that which through it cannot be given without merit, cannot be denied without ruin. He asks for the whole heart, give it to him. It is his, both by creation and by redemption. He asks for your intellect, give it to him. It is his. He asks for your money. Give it to him. It is his. And that's Ellen White again, Acts of the Apostles, page 566. Are we actually refusing God if we fail to give our tithes? What would the church do with the massive increase in the storehouse if every Seventh-day Adventist paid a faithful tithe? I guess we asked that question already. Jesus knew exactly how corrupt the Jewish leaders were who received the money given to the temple. But he commended the widow for giving her two mites. What does that teach us about our responsibility to pay into the storehouse? It's interesting that in, in, in Bible times, they believed, it was believed that men inherited the property. Women were, were more or less owned by men. And they were the place where the man would plant his seed and she would give birth to the children. But she really, a, a, a widow was like a, a piece of property without an owner. Yeah. And yet this widow came and gave her two mites and Jesus said, there's someone who's really given. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 13, I'm sorry, chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Surely you know that the men who work in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who offer the sacrifices on the altar get a share of the sacrifices. In the same way, the Lord has ordered that those who preach the gospel should get their living from it. Is that a fair system? Do we individually have any responsibility not only for paying back our faithful tithes but also encouraging others to do the same? Is that what we're doing here? Apparently. <laughs> That's what the Sabbath school lesson is about this quarter, isn't it? Yeah. Is that our responsibility? Or, is, or should we say, well, that's, each person's money is his own responsibility. I, I don't need to say anything about it. Well, with the, the tithes, it's pretty cut and dry. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody um, should be paying tithes how much in terms of offerings, uh, then you could say, well, it's, it's kind of up to you, you know, how much you, you give and where you give it and such. Uh, but the tithe is, is the Lord's. Okay. Well, is there, is there any kind of direct relationship between our faith and our paying of tithe? We, we, I'm, I keep asking this question because the lesson keeps asking it. What do you think? 
Well, the base of our relationship with God is faith, and uh, it's, you know, He provides us with life and health and, and uh, sustenance, and, and we, uh, uh, on our part, we return a portion of that for the support of His work, for the building up of His kingdom. Okay. And as we uh, do that, and as we grow in faith, those would, that would be one of the things that could help our faith grow, is, mm -hmm. is yeah. when we participate in the things of God. Yeah. Well, one of the benefits of tithing is that it stimulates our generous impulses and discourages selfishness. And we know selfishness is the very essence of Satan's kingdom. So if paying tithe can reduce our, 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 our tendencies towards selfishness, it certainly helps, right? Does it encourage us to pay a faithful tithe when we hear about ministerial workers and other Bible workers giving sacrificially of their time and efforts to spread the gospel? Are you more likely to want to support the pastor if you see he's doing a good job? Yeah, I would think so. There's a very interesting uh, story told in connection with this lesson in the teacher's Bible study guide about a young girl who uh, had a friend and she wanted to share the gospel with her friend. But she knew that the friend's husband was very against Christianity. So she went over to the friend's house one time when she thought the husband wouldn't be around. Wouldn't you know, just about the time she's starting with her Bible study, the husband walks in. And she was really worried. And this is another country, not, not in the United States. She was worried this guy would take her on. But he, 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 he scowled and he didn't look very happy and he went off. But he didn't say anything. He let her continue with her Bible study. And after a few weeks, she kept coming back. After weeks, he, a few weeks, he decided he would join in the Bible study. And then some others, or they, uh, the, the wife's parents got interested. And they, they, they asked for Bible studies. And anyway, and other brothers and sisters that end up because this girl was bold enough to, to do that one Bible study, she ended up getting bapt baptizing. She didn't do it herself, but bringing nine people into the church. That's a pretty impressive story. Well, it, would, it might be easy for us to look at the massive church organization and say, you know, there's all that money out there. You know, how can my little tiny tithe make any difference? Ever been tempted to think like that? Well, Ellen White discussed this, and what was her illustration? Do you remember? See, it's like, it's like the raindrops. It's one drop here, one drop there, so forth, and maybe they come down fairly, fairly vigorously, but what happens? They collect into a little tiny rill, you might even call it a little tiny few drops together, and they run down, and then those gather with others, and pretty soon, what happens? We've got a mighty river emptying into the ocean, which in turn is heated up by the sun, and vapor, rise comes, vapor goes up and comes back out over the land, and, and this, the, the, the whole process continues. She says, that's, that's the way it is with the tithe. We may, you know, may our, our little bit may not seem like one much, but if, there were no, if we each give a drop, we end up with a mighty river. If we give nothing, and nobody gives anything, there's a drought. We have a drought. Well, it may not be obvious everywhere that uh, giving tithe is promoting a rapid growth of the church. I mean, I know I have been tempted a few times to think, well, boy, the, the, the church work is really growing rapidly in Central America, or the church work is really growing rapidly in India right now, or maybe it's really rapidly growing in Russia. So maybe I should send my tithe over there, and, and it, would, it would have a bitter, bigger impact. Um, is that a fair thing to do? By paying your tithe, and it's going over there, it's going to the right, I mean, it's going to pay for church workers? Ask our conference. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't consult them. And I've never done that. I always paid, it, always paid my tithe faithfully to the local church. But you, you can see where people might say, well, you know, not much is happening here. Why don't we give our money over there where something's really happening? Well, what does God do in answer to that? Is he say, well, 
you know, the, this, this land over here is more productive, so I'm going to give them more sunshine. Is that the way it works? Or more rain? God's rain and sunshine, he's, you know, in our day, we kind of wonder how some of this is distributed. We need some rain here right now, but, mm. but, you know, Matthew 5 says he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. He sends his everything on the just and the unjust. And yet we have stories like you told not too far distant about the farm that, you know, fires come up to it, but don't burn it. Mm -hmm. Well, there are those who feel that because they are not satisfied with the progress being made in a certain area of the church work, it is okay for, to withhold their tithe. Well, these two previous illustrations, the, the woman with her two mites and then the story about the rain and so forth, make it very clear that this is not God's plan. We need to be a part of the larger picture. Was Jesus supported by tithe? He was supported by some women who... Oh, women? Look at Luke 8, 1 to 3. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. So he's doing his work. The 12 disciples went with him. Yeah, we know about that. And so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, we know about her, from whom seven demons had been driven out. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer at Herod's court. I mean, this is a society woman a wealthy society woman, and Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. Wow. So who supported Jesus and his disciples? Women. So do we have any idea whether they had money or not? Well, Judas hanging around, so they must have had something. <laughs> I've often wondered where they stayed. Yeah. Women like that, I don't think we're really used to sleeping out in the dirt. Maybe they had cash to spread around for themselves to keep, you know. It's, it's stay in the inn. There were, yeah, there were inns. Yeah. yeah, from village to village, yeah. yeah. But those were probably mostly gifts, weren't they? Do we have any idea how, how wealthy Mary Magdalene was? The alabaster box. The alabaster box he poured on Jesus, and some people said that was enough. That the cost of that box, that that uh, myrrh was it was in there well, anyway. Whatever was in there, perfume. perfume, perfume, was a year's salary for a common war laborer. So obviously she wasn't she wasn't poor, and her uncle was a Pharisee. So he was getting some off the top. <laughs> I wish I would. I wish we knew a lot more about how these women worked with Jesus and the disciples. I think we're gonna we're gonna find out a lot of very interesting stuff about all this, and in, in when we get into the better kingdom. As Dennis suggested, I think perhaps these women were giving their offerings, not their tithe, to Jesus. Well, wouldn't Jesus qualify as a gospel worker? Absolutely, but it's direct, you know, it's going against what you were just talking about, <laughs> giving to the church as a whole. God forbid that we give our money directly to God, right? Absolutely, you can't do that. <laughs> well, there's lots of passages we've looked at now that talk about the purposes of tithing and so forth. 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14, Mark 16, 15, Matthew 28, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 Timothy 5, Malachi 3, we've looked at all those. In 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, Paul was quoting from Deuteronomy 25, 4, Matthew 10, 10, and Luke 10, 17. We've already looked at those. Paul clearly felt that those who are willing to spend their lives ministering to the cause of God deserve their pay. In fact, in one verse, it, some, it seems to suggest that they deserve a double pay. Are we ready to accept God's challenge and His blessings? Are we willing to try the special partnership with God? If you were starting to, if you were starting to, uh, trying to start a business and you were looking for a business partner, could you pick a better one than God? Nope. Are we ready to be channels of blessing rather than stagnant reservoirs? The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been blessed with more truth and inspired material available to us than any other people in history. We are also a fairly wealthy church. 
compared to others in the past. Are we going to hoard or are we going to share? In, light, in the light of the passages that we have read, does it seem to you that we are just adding to God's storehouse, to his divine pockets, so to speak? Or is the main blessing that comes from tithing for the one who returns that tithe to God? What do you think now that we've... Because we're, it's more blessed to give than to receive, being able to, to give. Well, why is that? Um, because we can see, because love is directed at others. Yeah. And when we see others blessed by whatever it is we have to give, whether it's spiritual or material, Okay, if we know that the, joy. yeah, if we know that the principle of Satan's government is selfishness, and the pr principles of God, the main principle of God's government is love. Love means giving and sharing, mm -hmm. being kind to others, right? <clears throat> so, would it be a good idea to practice some of that? Get your mind off yourself. Well, are we tempted to think that meeting our own needs comes from our own efforts? Do we daily recognize that we do not need anything without, we do not do anything without the power and blessing of God? Do we recognize that the finishing of the gospel depends on the faithful efforts of pastors, teachers, evangelists, and us? Would we like to hasten the second coming? I would. Those who are supported by the cause of God are not always perfect. You know, if we had to wait for the perfect person to come and do it, how many would we have? working in the cause of God? None. Just God himself. They, are often, they often make mistakes like the rest of us, but that does not mean that we should withhold money from God's cause. Are we prepared to receive even more blessings from God by returning the tithe to him? Do you think if anybody was paying a faithful tithe, well, like, I mean, that woman who gave in her two mites, do you think she was blessed by God? Yes. Absolutely, I'm sure she was blessed by God that illustration that Jesus used. And if we pay a faithful tithe, do you think God will allow us to suffer unequivocally un, un, because we paid a tithe? I don't think so. In fact, I'm sure it wouldn't be. God wants to bless every one of us, including you. Our kind and loving Father, it's a great privilege to talk about you, to read your word, and to now recognize most clearly the spelling out of some of these responsibilities that we need to recognize and we need to, to do to carry out in our own lives. Help us to be the humble givers that we need to be, to be the people who are sharing the gospel, not only of our, our spiritual wealth, but our financial wealth as well. We want to be more like you. May it be so is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.